As I said, Joyce, thanks very much for coming on. Uh, I know obviously you're you're making the transition over to MMA, but we've been looking into your story and it's been a very interesting one. Um, so I'd, I'd just like to take you back, obviously, to um, when you joined the NBA, NBA. You were a first round draft pick and your story is interesting, especially the mental health aspect, because right now, I don't know how it is in the States, but in the UK, it's... It's something that a lot of people are speaking about. It's affecting a lot of people at the moment. So could you take us back to when you joined the NBA and you shared your concerns with your, your lack of the mental health, health policy and the pushback yeah. you got from them? Yeah, so um, I was drafted in 2012, 2013, and um, I had been diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder, panic attacks, uh, about four years previous at 16, 17 years old. And um, I had been public with that while I was in college. And I had a, a university at Iowa State University, uh, Fred Hoiberg, who is a former NBA player, uh, general manager, and now former NBA coach as well, who was my coach at Iowa State University. And he uh, he was just very understanding of what I was going through. And he was also just very respectful of the health the field of health and medicine because he had an open heart surgery. His career was shortened by, by his open heart surgery. So I think we had a common understanding around how important health is. Um, as I arrived in the NBA, uh, obviously I went under a draft process where there was a lot of conversation and scrutiny basically around mental health, uh, and how the NBA viewed mental health. And so you know, I had to start to push back on those mental health stigmas, even going through the draft process, uh, different teams saying that, you know, the anxiety disorder was a concern or, you know, that they didn't really, they had question marks because of the anxiety disorder. Basically, you know, framing the anxiety disorder that I deal with as in alignment with character issues. You know, when, when we're athletes, especially the athletes who undergo draft process and draft vetting, we go through a a screening of whether or not a guy is reliable and has character issues. My anxiety disorder was being viewed and characterized as, um, you know, a personal flaw. Even though I had gone through an entire season at Iowa State, actually two seasons where my anxiety disorder didn't cause me to miss a single single game or even a practice for that matter. Um, So upon my arrival in the NBA, I had to face all of those stigmas. And when I finally got to the NBA, uh, it became clear to me that it was because there was no institutional, um, there was there was no institutional culture around mental health that was formal. Um, so I pushed on the NBA to create a mental health policy. There was not a single sentence specifically relating to mental health in our entire collective bargaining agreement. I said that that obviously was was insufficient, and we needed to create a policy, and and we should do it, and we needed to do it right then and there, and. Um, their medical staff, doctors that, that advised and informed them all thought that it was doable, all thought it was uh, feasible, um, you know, to, to create that policy. We're willing to help with that policy. Uh, mental health professionals from around the world were willing to help collaborate to create that policy. And they just didn't want to create one. And they told me that, you know, we don't have to create one. You're not, you're not big enough for us to have to create one. You haven't done enough for us to have to create one. Who are you to tell us, you know, what we what we do and don't have to do. And, you know, I believe that there's a serious racial component to that. And then not that a white player wouldn't have been able to come and change that system, but you know, there, there's still a real atmosphere and culture in America of, um, the system or the establishment fearing competent black men, right? Uh, mm-hmm. black men in general, of course, uh, there's that too, but there's an, there's a special kind of fear around competent black men, around black men who can rightfully challenge the system and point out things that the system needs to change that they can't argue against. And, you know, that's kind of the difference between me and a guy like Colin Kaepernick is people can argue the race issue. We see that. They continue to argue the race issue. People can argue about patriotism uh, and what that means. People can gerrymander that. People can, you know, weaponize it. People can manipulate that conversation. Nobody can manipulate the mental health conversation. And yeah. so I was seen as a special threat, a threat where, you know, we can't let this guy even reach the platform of a Colin Kaepernick. We can't let this guy play a single game because if he does and he gets any type of platform at all for his ability and skill, we're going to have problems stopping the steamroll that will be 
you know, uh, at our front door. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, it seems like an organization, an organization the size of the NBA, it seems like they've got the finances, they've got everything in place that they could quite easily implement um, the things you're talking about. And I know you played in the big three, and things were implemented there as well. And I would assume that's easy would have been easy enough for them to transfer. So is that, is that why you're looking at it as it is coming from a different point of view? It's nothing to do with uh, finances, anything like that. I mean, I, you know, I think I think again that the, the mental health issue that I that I was involved with um, in regards to the NBA highlights so many important dynamics culturally for us here in America and really the West because in the West we believe that um, that the bottom line is really the bottom line, but really it's not. Right. Um, Because with the mental health situation, we see a dynamic where or a situation where tending the mental health properly, especially with regards to the workforce, only shows an increase in productivity. So nobody can say that the money doesn't make sense because the money will give you a return on investment. One thousand percent. So it, it shows us or it lends evidence to the fact that there's something even beneath the bottom line for capitalists in the West. And that's what was shown in my situation, because had we implemented the mental health um, program that that I was suggesting that the doctors around me were suggesting back then, we wouldn't have had to come six years later and then have the same group of people who were already at the table go, oh, yeah, there is a mental health crisis. And oh, yeah, we're not getting as much out of our players because they're unhappy. Adam Silver went on on uh, what's my guy's name? Uh, uh, um, Sorry, his name is a little uh, Bill Simmons. He went on the, the Bill Simmons you know, you could call it talk that they had at the analytics conference. And he said right in front of the world, you know, our players are unhappy. This is a generation of anxiety. There's a generational anxiety. And I thought it was such a a slap in the face to the fans and the public who have watched Adam Silver's leadership because he was there as deputy commissioner when I said there's a mental health crisis and they did nothing to address that. They actually made it seem like I was a diva or I was asking for special treatment. So you know, I think there's a bottom line in America and in the West. Um, I think the mental health thing lends to that. And where people don't want to deal with the mental health issue, um, they're showing us that there's something beneath the bottom line that's at play. Yeah, and, and like I say, that he, obviously speaking about the mental health issue as well, because I can speak for here in the UK, and especially at my part of the UK, Scotland, it's something that's very prevalent at the moment, especially with gyms and stuff like that still being closed. So I think it's... It's good for people with your platform as well to be discussing it. Um, and p- before we move on to MMA, I know, I'm, I'm guessing your, your MMA debut has kind of been put on hold a little bit because obviously we've had a global pandemic, but also this year um, we had the, the murder of George Floyd. And from that, you were involved in starting the, the 10K Foundation as well. Um can you tell us a wee bit about how, how the foundation started and just speak to us a bit, a bit about what the foundation has been doing? I know you've had a lot of protests and peaceful protests at that. Okay, so, um, yeah, so I have a relationship with Stephen Jackson, who's a, a relative of George Floyd. And, you know, our relationship stems from my time in the Big Three. You know, we're co-workers and um, me and him are cut from the same cloth, you could say. So... Uh, when I found out that he was related to George Floyd and that he would be coming to town, I told him that I would, would be there for him and support. And, um, you know, over the following days, I was just trying to think about how I could utilize my own, um, my own position here in the community to bring more people out. And the, the thing I thought about immediately was to bring more athletes, you know, to the, to the front lines and support to him and, and to support um, George Floyd and, and getting justice and, um, you know, speaking back to the system. So that's what we did. Uh, initially, we just organized a group of athletes and said, hey, we're going to go march as the athletes. Um, if people want to come along, great. If not, you know, we're going to go and, and, you know, go to the front lines on our own. Um, it just so happened to end up being like 7,500 people that went with us the first time. So after that, it, it kind of became a thing of its own. It, it took on its own life. And uh, a couple of days later, we went to go march again and it was 20,000, 22,000. And that's the march where we were out on the bridge on 35W and uh, the tanker drove onto the bridge 
Um, and, and we've done about six or seven marches on uh, since that since that day. And, you know, it's been, you know, 60, 60, 65,000 people that have come out and joined us as we've, you know, we continue to respond to the George Floyd situation here. Uh, we only formalized the, the 10K Foundation as a way to create some more, you know, formality to, to what we're doing and try and structure the ideas and goals around what we really want to see done in the long term. Were you surprised by just the, the numbers you've spoke about there, the amount of people that turned out in support? Did, did that surprise you at all, the amount of people that were there? Every single time. You know, every single time. You know, the, the first four marches, I would say, we were in a pattern where we did a march um, and we said, okay, that's it. And then so many people, you know, reached out to us and said, you got to do another one that we kind of just decided to do another one on the fly. And, um, you know, in a matter of 48 hours, we would put the word out that we were going to go again and win again. And more people came out. I think the second time that we went out, the, the Nobel March that we did, um, we probably again, again, we went out on May 29th. The Nobel March was probably on the 31st, I would say you know, or you know, maybe mm -hmm. the, the first of June. And the first time we went out, there was about 700 people maybe outside of U.S. Bank Stadium, which is where the Minnesota Vikings play. And, you know, by the time we made it to 35W, we were probably 7,500 uh, in number. By the time we got to U.S. Bank Stadium to start the second March, there was already 10,000 people out there waiting. And by the mm -hmm. time we took off, about, about an hour later from that, there was like 20, 22,000 people. That's the the march that you saw, uh, Beyonce uh, posted a, a picture of us coming across Hennepin Bridge, uh, which I actually went to high school right there off of Hennepin Bridge on Nicollet Island. So there's a lot of history to it. Uh, it mm -hmm. was it was a very historic moment. And yeah, I was shot by the numbers every time going into every march ahead of time. I would be, you know, telling the people that were help organize, hey, you think people are going to come today? And, you know, to show up and there's 10,000 people there is hard to really describe. Yeah, and, and I guess out with that, if you look, I mean, obviously I'm out here in Scotland, in the UK, um, and it's it's now became, a, it's reached things globally, where it's reaching here out in Scotland, it's reaching the UK. When you see that, is this, is this the opportunity for change in America in terms of policing and things like that? And I know you've spoken before about your own experiences. I think you've spoken about being in your car back in 2016 when you were surrounded by armed police. You feel this is the opportunity now with everything that's going on where changes can be made? I think the, the potential for change is going to continue to lie with the will of the people. Um, mm -hmm. You know, what, what 10K Foundation has done is try to, again, formulate the ideas around what that change could look like and be an, a, a new institution for that change. So the ideas that we're, or the idea that we are really focusing heavily on is one of sovereignty, of what it means for communities to be sovereign uh, and, and what the social contract is between the free people and the state. Um, in our case, the free people of America and the United States, but um, all across the world, the free people of any country, any society underneath the rule of whatever government exists. Um, and it's not to overthrow the government. It's not to abolish police. It's not to create a situation of total anarchy or, or a lawless land or no rules. Um, but it is to say that many, many of our states across the modern society have become out of control, overextended, um, tyrannical, over, over militarized. And the culture and attitude of that has seeped into our communities, right? And, and I wrote a piece recently to. Uh, an individual I won't say, but uh, I talk in this piece about how from, you know, looking from it, looking at it from afar, you can see how our, our uh, ambition to intimidate and, and uh, war across the world is now a reflection in our most local places, in our most local communities, right? Uh, and when I was out there at the third precinct, when it burned down, which is, you know, in South Minneapolis, the relatively the neighborhood where George Floyd was murdered, it reminded me of the 1990s or 2000s and Middle Eastern footage of, of the crazy riots and, 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 uh, and terrorist situations that were occurring in those places. Right. Um, so, you know, an idea of sovereignty. Right. And what is sovereignty? Freedom of movement, freedom of uh, economy and, and freedom of representation. 
right? And so what do those things mean? And, and trying to flush it out and get that message to the people that uh, the country doesn't own us. Yeah. That the country doesn't get to have a monopoly on violence. They don't, don't get to say when, where, and how uh, people can be physically violent and use le- lethal force if necessary. Um, and, and they also don't get to say where we can and can't go, right? Uh, if we're going to be peaceful, if we're going to be law abiding, you know, now we're, we are towing the line of law abiding, right? When you go out and you stop a federal highway, right? That's, that's towing the line, but it's rightful in response to the murder of one of our people, of, of one of our citizens, um, black people. Yes, but a citizens in general. And I do think that black America is positioned properly because of our lived experience to lead um, us into this next version of modern society, especially here in America and in the West. The, the black man has a lived experience that qualifies us or, or gives us validity in, in reshaping this country. And so, you know, that's what the 10K Foundation has, has come around um, in support of and, and the ideas that we're trying to foster and build and get across to the people. Yeah, and also on top of that, um, I've seen you're going to be going for a very, very long walk. Uh, I believe you're, you're, is it 1,000 miles you're planning walking? Oh, oh, and you're walking right to the White House. Um, I believe, when is it that's planned for? Um, we have a tentative start date we haven't released yet. Um, ahead of the election is, is what I'll say. And yeah, it's from the George Floyd Memorial all the way to 1600 Pennsylvania. So it's 1100 miles and you know, I'll be, uh, I'll be taking every step. And, and I believe that you're, you're looking to deliver a, is it a letter you're going to be delivering to the white house, potentially trying to deliver that to president Trump himself? Yeah. I mean, you know, there's a letter, a uh, declaration of sovereignty, which outlines uh, what, what I, and what we believe is the future of the relationship between the state and the people um, that no longer can we uh, be ruled by this uh, huge overstretched state and, and, and certainly not ruled in a way where we elect government officials and then we have to wait until re-election to hold them accountable for the promises they either keep or don't keep, um, that we're going to become much more active. And in that activity, we are going to, uh, um, you know, make do on the promises that are, that are um, you know, given by our leaders in real time. Right. That's kind of the mode of the Declaration of Sovereignty and that our communities do need to be given back to the communities, especially the black community. Most of all, Uh, we don't have any banks. We have no real hands in the institutions that we live in or live under. Um, And so there's also a reparations act. And I think the reparations do need to be discussed, Um, whether that's the 14 trillion dollar number, you know, is, is something that I hope to discuss. And we have some some more ideas as well. I think. You know, what I outlined to Kyrie Irving regarding Operation Black Bank, where we put one or two bank, uh, black banks and black communities all across this country is very doable financially. Um, Somebody still has to put the money up. I believe that the the wealthy blacks in America and around the world have the money to make that investment with some help from the people who profit from their celebrity. Right. Our black celebrities are are primarily the black wealthy in our country Um, and, and the people that are their partners or that make money off of them could lend that money as well uh, in order to, to create, to restructure the, the infrastructure, to restructure the black economy in, in this country. Um, and we're talking 15 to $20 million to build a bank, um, yeah. to start a bank, right? It's not a crazy price. No. Um, and in addition to that, you know, there is a idea about the credit of black America and how America is, probably one of the biggest spending demographics in our country, yet we have disproportionately bad, bad credit. Um, and, and the credit thing is something that we believe that we could fix. It's something that we believe can be repaired, um, can be uh, forgiven, let's say, uh, in the interest of the historical context of blacks in this country, and that going forward, we could have a positive credit score and start from there. And um, that economic move actually would be, would be for the betterment of America and ultimately the West. You know, I think I think what my real message to Donald Trump is, is uh, or what my real message to Donald Trump will be is that America reconciling with blacks 
is going to determine uh, the fate of the West. Yeah. I mean, that, that sounds like a lot of pressure on your shoulders, Royce. Is that a pressure you feel? You know, I, I think my time as an athlete has groomed me to be able to take pressure well. I don't really feel that uncomfortable in this situation with, what, mm-hmm. with what's in front of me, um, to be honest. I, I understand the gravity of it for sure. I understand the weight of the moment, but I also understand that in the grand scheme of things, it's also going to be uh, just another moment, you know, just a, a speck of time. And, and we're in a situation right now, I think, around the world as a species where these small micro moments are going to have disproportional impact on, on what happens, the trajectory of humanity. But um, there will be many more moments. So, you know, in that sense, it's just like, you know, I was here at the epicenter when the George Floyd murder happened. I had a personal connection to a relative. I took it upon myself to take my community to the, to the front lines. We went to the front lines. We had success. We had peaceful marches. We didn't have one incident. We didn't have one arrest. We didn't have one fight. We didn't have one fire. Um, and so, you know, the spirit and the momentum that's behind me uh, calls for me to take it further. And obviously that leads to our nation's capital. And I don't think the things we're asking for are um, outrageous by any means. I think the credit of black America can be fixed. I think we can have an, an influx of black banks that allow black Americans to have a hand in, in an institution that, that dictates uh, property ownership uh, uh, you know, and, and, and other types of ownership. I think that that's, that that's doable. And I also think that the federal government can FDIC insure those banks so they're not just small credit unions that end up failing. The, the banks of black America need to be seen as too big to fail the same way as the white banks. Um, yeah. and, and all of that is a part of an initiative or an attitude or approach that says the reconciliation of black America and the arrival of black America on an equal playing field will ultimately shape where this country goes uh, or the destiny of this country. Yeah. And with all that, um, all that in mind, you, you obviously had announced um, you were transitioning over to MMA. Um, now, I know you had, I believe you had started training with somebody who's well known in the, in the MMA field, somebody who's well respected, uh, Greg Nelson. Is that, is that who you started your MMA training with? Yep, Sensei Nelson. Excellent. And obviously, Greg Nelson's um, coached a lot of top level fighters, most notably people would know former UFC heavyweight champion Brock, Brock Lesnar. Um, I take it the MMA is still something you're pursuing at the moment, but it's just, I'm assuming it's just moved slightly to the back burner. Would that be the case at the minute? Well, you know, one thing that I've really embraced in, in this transition is that martial arts is a lifelong endeavor. Yeah. Um, and I consider myself a martial artist, and I don't think that there will be a time until the day I die where I stop training. Yeah. One thing that I love about martial arts um, and that, that I love maybe most about it is that I can train whenever, wherever. Yeah. Um, so I've continued to train, obviously COVID-19 threw a monkey wrench and everybody's gym training and everybody's, um, uh, you know, athletic endeavors and, and competition all, all around the board. For me, it seemed like it, I needed to contribute more personally to this black initiative, to this pro black initiative, to this, a pro-black movement before returning to competition. Um, when the walk is done, I think there will be things in place for me to contribute to, to oversee, to help with the ideas and the thought leadership of, and get back to my, my pursuit of, of the heavyweight title. And, and I think that um, it's doable, you know? And so, you know, we're not on hold. We're still, we're still training and preparing. I'm still studying every night but when I'm not watching, you know, uh, old school footage of, political debates and, and other people who came before me who spoke uh, very eloquently and very intelligently about their times and, and the, the landscape socially. I'm watching UFC heavyweight fights and doing my homework on what, what may be my, my future opponents. And obviously we just had a big UFC fight there, UFC 252 for the heavyweight title. Uh, mm-hmm. Did you manage to catch that fight, Miocic versus Cormier? I did. I did. Um, it was a great fight, man. I, I, I enjoyed it. Um, tough break, I thought, for DC to get poked in the eye like that. Um, one of the parts of the sport that, you know, comes with it, but, you know, you just can't say enough about the fans really kind of missing out somewhat on 
on what you would you would consider a, a prime fight when two athletes have both of their eyesight and 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 it happens and plays out like that. But it went all five rounds. Um, you know, I thought the decision was was right. I think both of them are great champions. DC gets a, a bad break, in my opinion. I've I've watched crowds boo him. I've watched people, you know, not you know say they don't like him on the internet. I like DC. I think he's yeah. super cool. I think he was a great champion. He's been a great champion. Everybody speaks highly of his work ethic. As athletes, you can only respect that. Um, he's always done it clean. Never popped for for uh, roids. So I respect that. And you know, Stipe is a great champion as well. And um, you know, if he wants to call it quits then, you know, that's, that's up to him. If, if he has a couple more fights in him, uh, you know, John Jones super fight or whatever else he decides to do, that's also uh, up to him, obviously. I, I view every single heavyweight, everybody who could potentially fight as he- a heavyweight as a, a potential future opponent. So um, I'm, still, I'm still studying. I'm still studying him. Uh, I'm still studying D.C. You know, I, when I make the jump, God know, only God knows how fast the, the rise to that level will be. Um, and, and I, I'd like to be over prepared rather than under prepared. So most people would go, you know, you'll never fight DC. You know, by the time you're ready to fight, he'll be, we don't know, you know, and, and to speak to Greg Nelson's training and, and coaching and, and Brock Lesnar's rise in the UFC, he fought once, twice, and he was, you know, in there with, with, with Randy Couture. So, yeah. you know, you just, you just don't know. And especially at the heavyweight division, we would all be, you know, bullshitting ourselves if we didn't say that it was a thin division. I know that. We all yeah. know that. Yeah. Yeah. And also, even in terms of your age, and in terms of when you look at, uh, like, DC just thought he's 41, there, uh, Steep is 37. Um, so it feels like you've still got time. You've still got time on your side as well. Um, and in terms of the, the, the depth of the heavyweight division, it has always been notoriously not the deepest division in the UFC or, or sort of most other promotions. The other thing you, you, you've mentioned before uh, is you're not going down the amateur route, you're just going to go straight in there as a professional. Is that just basically, it's a, you putting yourself in a position where it's, it's sink or swim? Yeah, I, I, that's my approach. You know, now, obviously, I respect Coach Nelson enough to, to allow him to have a say in that. Mm-hmm. Um, I respect Adi and Tim enough to allow them to have a say in that. Um, and, and, and some of the other fighters who are, you know, veterans that are in our stable to, to, you know, lend their opinion on that as well. Um, for me, I'm confident in, in what I'm going to be able to bring to the table that makes up for my, my lack of experience. Um, I do believe that I can make the jump straight to pro and be effective and, and be successful in, in there. Um, you know, how soon it is. We'll see, you know, that, that's, that, that, that whole process is going to take on a life of its own and it's going to depend on what promotion we work with and, and what they're willing to accommodate, right? What, we're, what we can come to an agreement about. Yeah. Um, and when I say the, the, light, the heavyweight division is thin, I mean no disrespect to the other heavyweights. It's just thin because there's a lack of, lack of bodies, yeah. right? Uh, and, and, and there's certainly a lack of um, hyper-athletic, entertaining bodies at that size too. Right. So it's, it's it, I mean, no disrespect by it. Obviously, you know, you know, there's a ton of incredible, incredible fighters at the at the heavyweight uh, divi- in the heavyweight division. Um, but it has been notoriously thin compared to other divisions. Right. So, yeah. um, you know, I'm 29 years old, but I'm a young 29. Right. Me being blackballed from the NBA, me having to go through, you know, a seven year uh, exodus or a seven year, um, you know, exile from the NBA due to this mental health fight means that my wheels are incredibly fresh. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I view myself as a 23 year old athlete, right? I've missed six years of playing. And since I was 18, I've only played three full seasons, two in Canada and one at, the, at Iowa state university. Um, so even by basketball standards, I'm somebody who has no mileage, not low mileage, no mileage. And I haven't had a single orthopedic injury that has kept me from competition uh, in, in my entire adulthood. So I'm very, very fresh, and I'm very, very talented, and I'm very confident that I'll be able to step in there and, uh, and have a successful career. And I guess the other thing which differ, differs you from maybe a lot of heavy, heavyweights starting out in mixed martial arts, as you do, it's 
you're an ultra athlete, so that for you when you transitioned into MMA, did that did that help you when you started training MMA? Just the athletic background you have and the, the physical attributes you have as well, in terms of just your, your size, your your hand size as well, that's notable. Um, do you feel all those things transferred over well when you started training in MMA? I mean, yes, yes and no. I think when I first started off, there were some there were some technical things that I just needed to know. Um and and I still had to go from being a fan and somebody who was who had my eyes on the transition to actually loving it and then understanding yeah. the nuances of it and then falling in love with the nuance of it, right? And so there's those layers. Now where I think I'm at, um, or where I was very shortly into it, is tapping into some of my natural skills. And so, you know, even even by a basketball player standard, I was unique. Yeah, I was a, I was a 260 pound six eight point forward. I played point guard at 260 pounds, and actually, when I was at Iowa State, I walked around at like 275 sometimes. So I was playing point guard at 275 was unheard of, um, and and I and I led my team in all statistical categories, which means that I was very well rounded. Now, you can't be a well rounded basketball player without a few things. Number one, you have to have an incredible feel. Number one, you have to have an incredible feel for the game. Number two, you have to have great tempo. And number, number three, you have to have uh, a high IQ. You have to understand what's going to happen out there before it happens. You have to understand time and score. You have to understand the flow of the game uh, um, in the abstract, in the conceptual, and then able to go out there and create based on that, that general understanding of where people are going to be and when. So I think all of those things transition well to martial arts. And actually, it's probably going to be a bit easier in one sense that I don't have to keep track of nine other bodies. Uh, I only yeah. have to keep track of one other body. Uh, but obviously, the risk and, and the, the danger is, is heightened to a, a whole nother level than in, in basketball. Um, but there's, there's, there's less moving parts. So, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to benefit me in some ways, my athletic background. And then in some ways, I'm going to have to have to have some growing pains. And, and I'm all for that. Like, I'm not here to, to think that I'm just going to, you know, run into the UFC and have a, a blaze of glory, shoot straight to the top, take whoever's sitting on the throne's belt and, and retire with some perfect career. I think anybody who's, who believes that um, is in for a rude awakening. And as we see MMA evolve. Right. I think a lot of people, I mean, Darren Till, for example, is a guy who who I personally like a lot as a fighter. Um, and I know he he didn't have any lack of humility, but us as fans who like Darren Till, we kind of get this idea like, oh, man, you don't want to see your guy lose. And I think he's handled defeat really well. And, and who are we to even expect that fighters don't lose? I mean, these guys are so good. The fighters that he lost to are so good. Yeah. And, and the guys that... that you know, the sport is growing so quick and, and guys are getting better and better. They're getting more well-rounded. They're not specializing as much anymore. People are getting a little bit of everything and training that way. So, you know, I'm under no illusions that I'm going to run in there and just be, you know, some, some world beater. Um, but it's not beyond, it's not beyond my, uh, my vision either. You know, uh, I'm going to definitely try to be so. Yeah, I mean, lo loss is almost part of MMA, whether it be in competition or, or just in the gym, it's... Uh, I know for a lot of fighters we speak to you out in the gym uh, out here in Scotland, it's it's where most people most people grow. Um, we're, we're cert I'm certainly looking forward now to, to seeing when you finally make that debut. Um, hopefully, it won't be won't be too long. Do you think it might manage it this year, or be now a bit too late in the year, or is it, or is it a possibility even? In my year, I mean, I think, I think in my, in this year, in my 20, before my 30th birthday, yeah, I don't know before this calendar year, I mean, the COVID thing threw everything off so, yeah. so bad that, you know, now it's going to, it's going to really be up to whoever's having those conversations, you know, um, do I think I'm ready to fight? Depends on who I'll be fighting, <laughs> right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, am, am I ready to step in there with, with Steve or DC? No, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> Uh, and, and nobody would expect me to be. And, and I think yeah. that that would be uh, a silly move. But am I ready to get in there and mix it up with somebody at the pro level? I believe so. Brilliant. Well, uh, Royce, I won't take any, any more of your time. Thanks very much for actually giving us some time and come on and chatting to us. It's, uh, it's been very interesting researching you and, and, and have a look into you, everything that's been going on in your life. It's, uh, 
But we really appreciate it. We'll certainly look forward to your debut. Yeah, thank you guys, man. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. And, and hopefully I'll be back on when, when, when something else develops. Absolutely, mate. Thanks very much, Roy. Thanks, man. Be well. 